Thank you very much. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble to get this uh, slide. It was, worked, worked perfectly on my screen, but connected with the projector change resolution and all of this. Off. So it's supposed to be programming in parallel with threads, a scientific use case. So I would like to give you a bit of a use case of what you can do with threads. It's, I'm pretty focused on the use case, and then show you one solution what you can do with threads and where they're pretty useful. So uh, the use case is a scientific application. So we'll go into a little bit how this scientific application is uh, it's supposed to, what it's supposed to do. Uh, and we're about, uh, talking about contaminations in micro concentrations from agriculture and domestic housing. So you apply a lot of chemicals um, when you do agriculture, and then you have a house, you have a paint, and then the rain washes off some of the paint. So we talk about very, very small uh, concentrations um, here, and we have a use case, we have the River Rhine, which is a very big river in Europe here, I will show you in a minute, and that's, that's this uh, or area. So it's, it's a bit out of the screen, sorry, but that's the best I could get uh, in time here. So microcontaminations, so very small concentrations, so a few nano to micrograms per liter, uh, the liter is not there, in the river. Um, they have biochemical effects on water, water organisms, they can be pretty strong. So for instance, herbicides inhibit photosynthesis. And this has a very big impact on the whole e ecosystem because uh, if the photosynthesis is, is where everything starts, where all these organic substances are produced, and if this is inhibited, then th there might go something wrong in the ecosystem. Likewise, chemicals can uh, inhibit reproduction of fish. And currently, there are more than 100,000 registered chemicals in Europe. So it's a lot, a lot of them. Um, and this simulation model is it's just, a, we will see it, how it works. Uh, should, should be able to model most of them. Okay, some of the sources. So we have diffuse herbicide combinations from agriculture. Uh, you see here we have agriculture at different places. Um, and you can see here, uh, you apply lots of chemicals like herbicides and they are moved, not, not everything is actually used for the purpose, depending on the precipitation and the rain, some of them is washed into the river. And this is diffuse because it's widespread over a larger area. So that's one source, agriculture herbicides. The second source would be diffuse and point source combinations from buildings. So if you have buildings, then you have chemicals that are used for constructing the building, painting, for instance, plus rain, and then where the rains, the rain carries very, very small amounts of this stuff, and it finally ends up in the river. You have also contamination from households, like contaminations, um, and, and, uh, sorry, medication, radio-opaque substances, so if you go to the hospital and you eat it to get a better picture for x-ray and something like this, then eventually it will be end up in the river when you go back home. Cosmetics, household chemicals, artificial sweeteners is very interesting. They, per def definition, they don't have any calories, so it's not at attractive at all for any microorganism to break them down, but they don't break down. They can accumulate in the environment. And also effluent from sewage treatment plants. They are pretty good nowadays, but they don't get everything, especially those small um, concentrations of all kind of stuff, they won't be able to get it out. Okay, at the catchment area of the, uh, the River Rhine, you see here it's more than 1,200 kilometers long, and more than 800 kilometers of them you can use a ship, you can uh, uh, navigate on there. And the area is about 185,000 square kilometers, and the discharge varies between 1,000 and 2,000 cubic meters per second, depends where you are, and there are about eight, 58 million people living in this, in this area. So this is, would be the area that's called the catchment, so this green thing is called the catchment, so there's a, the area from where the water actually finally ends up in the, in the river. So all excess water from precipitation will end up in this river. Okay, and this is just the big catchment, but it consists of about 18,000 sub-catchments. So small areas, you can see here, you see the river and all this tributaries, so small other rivers that flow into the River Rhine eventually, and it's 18,000 of them, and you can delineate them in, in space, it's depending on the surface. Yeah? So always the water flows down, and then you always say, okay, this flows this direction, this direction, so you have different areas. Sub-catchments, we call them here. 
Now, let's have a short look how these numbers come about. So we have a lot of statistics. So you know about how much medication the average person consumes per year and how much of this will be actually ends up in the wastewater. And you know roughly how much of this can be, will be removed in the sewage treatment plant. And also, some of them are used in veterinary science. You know about uh, uh, a lot of animals get a lot of these medications. And then, typically, this is just a, a, a function of the population density. That's a population density. Dark colors means a lot of people. White means very few people. And you can see where people live around Zurich, and here in the, the, the rural area, and this one, and, and big cities. We have a lot of people, and of course, more people have more input into the river. And contamination from agriculture is a bit different. So you know about how much herbicides are usually used per crop. And we know what crops are growing there. And there's a loss rate. So the loss rate depends on the precipitation. The more it rains, the more it's lost. And also it depends on how the rain goes. So if there's a very strong rain, it might be more than if you have a little, a little bit of rain all the time. And you see it's different. It's not at the big cities, of course. It's more where the agricultural areas are. And you see this. Um, it's a wheat here. See, we have a lot of wheat. Is, you know how much they apply there. These are the statistical numbers that will be visited in the model. So, what are the available data? So, we have local discharge as a time series. So, we see this. We have hourly data for one year. We have land use data. So, we know if there's agriculture, if there are cities, and how many square kilometers or square meters of this will be in these catchment areas. And we know when these substances are applied over time. Uh, and also, we, we, we know the loss rates and decay rates of these substances. Some of them decay, some of them don't. Uh, so, or so, so little that we can neglect this, uh, this decay, so the, number, the amount will be reduced. So, there are there's some prior art already, so we, this project didn't develop, develop all the software. There's one external program written in C++, but we only use executable. And this calculates the concentration loads for one catchment. Yeah? So this is for one catchment and for one substance. So we have this for one catchment. And typically it reads an XML file with all this information. And then it also reads a CSV file with this time-varying data. I will show you in a minute. And it spits out a CSV at the end. So the result will be a CSV file. So that's how it looks like. So we have this, uh, this XML file. It's just a typical XML file with stuff inside. And you see it describes what the, the substance is and some of the features of the substance. Yeah, just, it's not very big. That's it already. So that's a, a few things. And many of them aren't, don't really apply. Yeah? So the general, and, and also you, you, you specify the name of the input file. This is the other file we'll show in a minute. And some of these features, what it is, and some of things what, what the model is supposed to do. OK. Time series is also very simple. So we have this time step. So we start in every time step stands for one hour. So about like 9,000 time steps. Process for one year. And we have a temperature, degree Celsius, precipitation, which is about zero here. And we have a discharge. So we know how much actually water flows for every hour from this um, subcatchment into the river. OK, the result will be a file that looks like this. So again, we have this time step here, which is also cut off. This is supposed to be step. And it echoes back the input. And then it gives you, this is the most important number. This is the concentration. In this case, it's atrazine, which is one of the substances. So that's what comes out. OK. Um, we had to prepare the data a little bit because we have 18,000 catchments. And we get them just in the wrong format. Though there is a file with 18,000 columns, but we need 18,000 rows. So we need to transpose these ones. I've done it with pandas. I don't talk about the details how to do this here. It would be a different topic. And the land use data also in a DBF file. We have the DBS file. We have to read it from there, as well as the subcatchment connections, which will be used for the next step. OK. So what do we need to do? So first, we have to get the data from this big file, as I said, rearrange these subcatchments. And that's actually what I want to talk about, this red box here. So we have to calculate the loads and concentration for each of these 18,000 subcatchments. And finally, I have to rearrange the data again, because I need them per time step, not per catchment. So that would be another post-processing step to rearrange the data. OK. Now, this is 
what we want to do, so we want to calculate 18,000 catchments. For each catchment, we get some input data, and then we, we run our external model, and we get some output. Of course, I programmed everything in Python 3. I think I saw this Python 3.5 at the time, but everything is running with Python 3.6. We use NumPy, Pandas, and PyTables, so because we store all the data in HDF5 format, which is a scientific format that can hold a very large amount of data, so you can have terabyte-sized files if you like. In this case, it's not that big. The output was just six gigabytes, so not that big. Okay. So we calculate the load and concentration from, for one catchment, and that's what we need to do. So we get those data from this HDF5 file, where I put it in. We generate the input files via this XML file. So I use a template, and I just have to fill in those missing things. It's not much. And also we have to generate this time series for the temp uh, for temperature, precipitation, and the discharge. Then we need a, an external process and wait till it's finished, and then we have to read the output from the external process and process it further. So there's four steps. And now we come to the core of this talk, actually, a case for threads. Is this a case for threads? So you might know CPython, so the standard Python has this what's called the global interpreter log. So even CPython supports threads from the very beginning. It uses operating system threads, and hence all the threads work as operating system threads. But actually they, they don't run in parallel in terms of CPU. So if you have CPU pound tasks, then even if you have multiple threads, they all run one after the other, and they never run exactly at the same time. So if you have CPU bound problems, th threads don't make sense because actually it will get slower because you have overhead switching from one thread to the other. If you have I.O. bound, input, output bound tasks, like reading and writing a file, starting external processes, then threads make sense because when you have input, output tasks, then Python releases the GIL, the global interpreter log, and you can take advantage of the threads. So this is very important. If you want to use threads, you typically have to work on the input, output bound things, otherwise you won't make things faster unless you want concurrency and you don't care about making things faster, that's also fine, uh, but you only release the GIL when you have input outbounds. That's a very important fact. So now let's re-exam our steps we have here. And if you go to the steps, then we see all of them actually are pretty much dominated by input-output. We generate files, we write files, we start an external process, which is by, most, uh, by far the most time. We spend, we'll see, and then we wait for the result, and then we read the outputs. So most of these tasks are input-output dominated, input-output bound. Though, we have a use case for our threads. Okay, this is a big picture. What happens? So, we have a main thread, and we have workers. These are the acting persons, you want to speak so, here in, in our process. Uh, the main thread is interacting with, with the data. It reads the data from this big HDFI file yeah, and saves the results back. And then it distributes the work to each worker. So it starts a new worker for each calculation. Yeah. The worker does the, their task. We will see this in a minute. So the worker actually is doing the calculation. And then the worker doesn't return in this case, but the worker puts the result into a queue. So whenever you can and you work with threads, you should use queues. Don't try to do locking. So there's other thing. If you want to work with different threads, you, you can do locking, but it's really not recommended because it's very, very difficult potentially to debug these things. Here I use a queue. So each worker is doing something. And when it's done, puts the result in a queue. And the main thread taking the result from the queue. So that's a, we may come back to this picture. Um, so, actually I do start a new thread for each, uh, for each worker, and now the question, isn't it inefficient, wouldn't it be better to use a thread pool? And maybe it's maybe, maybe, maybe more elegant to use a thread pool, but to talk efficiency, I did a short test, and starting 18,000 threads and joining them back takes about a second. Yeah, more or less on my machine. But the total runtime of my whole program is two and a half hours. So one second versus two and a half hours, it doesn't really matter for this use case. For this use case, it doesn't matter if you start so many threads and kill them uh, after this, because you can potentially 
gain maybe half a second or up to a second if you, if you do this. And if it's two and a half hours runtime, you can forget it. Yeah. So always, sometimes it makes sense to do use threads pools. And here, this case, in terms of time, it doesn't make any, this doesn't give you any advantage to do something like this. OK, so let's have a look at the code here. So how the code works. Oh, it's still so moved. I don't know why it's so uh, shifted here. So that's a, this is source code of the thread. So I import threading and the class thread from the threading module and the, from the Python standard library. And I need to inherit from thread to make it a thread. This is a worker that's doing all the work. And you see, I, this has, has a lot of methods, but all of them have underscores that mean they're only used internally inside the thread. So the, the thread has to generate the input files, which is either first the XML file and then the time varying file that's doing some work has to execute the external program, run it, get the result, then reads the output of this. So these are the, the tasks the worker has to do. But the only thing that's really concerned with the thread is run. So I have to override a method called run. And then we will see when you start the thread, this method will be executed. So these are just the things we showed, one, two, three, four, what's supposed to be done inside one of these workers. And the main thing is the run, which will be executed. And if you look at the run, you see that's how the run, run looks like. So the run is just creating the input, calling the execution of this external program that's doing the scientific calculation, and reads the output back. So that's what one of these threads is doing. And of course, this will be called 18,000 times. This run will be called 18,000 times. So this is how this looks like. And I just gave it all the subtasks names. It doesn't really matter what's inside. This is just uh, details. It has nothing to do with threads. The only the run method is important here. And then that's the boss. So the guy, the, the main thread. The main thread is just a normal class here. So you can inherit from object. And if you're in Python 3, actually, you don't have to. And this is, this is doing a lot of preparation work. Everything that has to be done once, like I, I generate the templates first that will be filled later on. I generate some temporary files, directories actually, where, the, which, where each worker is putting files and reading the output from. It opens the HDF5 file. So I have an open and init. You have to do something special with HDF5 to make it work here. In this case, you keep it open and close the HDF5 file. And then uh, I read the parameters, the global parameters, and so on. And then the interesting part is actually uh, this run all method. The run all method, it's doing the main work. And this is the only method that's concerned with threads. All the other ones are not concerned with threads. They do global tasks. So it's always a good idea when you work with threads to isolate this whatever concerns a thread in one method, if possible. Then you know if something goes wrong with the thread, you only have to look in this one method. It might not always be possible, but in this case, it's possible. So again, though the burst is doing something that concerns the global thing, so everything, everything that concerns all the 18,000 calculations you have to do. So I read the HDF5 output and write the HDF5 output. Theoretically, you could um, read in threads from the file, but I tried, it didn't work. So having giving all these workers access to the HDF5 file to read separately, it didn't work. And I think it doesn't really matter that much because when you read from the HDF5 file, typically the hard disk is the limiting factor anyway. So if eight or 10 or 50 threads read from one file, it won't get any faster because it doesn't come out any faster than uh, the hard drive delivers it. So I have this main thread reading the data and writing it back. And I don't think it's a bottleneck uh, because typically the, the hard drive is a limiting factor to, to be fast enough. Well, HDF5 is a very fast uh, way to read and write data because it's a binary format. So typically the hard drive is limiting. So this is not a problem. OK, uh, and now how did the communication works? Uh, I found this joke. I don't know if you understand. So for native speakers, it might be understandable. So the patient asks, I feel like a billiard ball. And the doctor says, please go to the end of the queue. So we're using queues. So if some, maybe somebody understands. Otherwise, I can give you a solution later. So we're using queues here to communicate. And that's what I would suggest to you when you use threads. 
always try to use Qt for communication between workers and the main thread. Has a big ad advantage also if you later want to go to multiprocessing. Typically, you can move your code to multiprocessing because multiprocessing uses a very, very similar model using queues for communication. Yeah, so that makes your life much easier. Don't, whenever you can, avoid shared structures of data where, where somebody is putting something in, somebody detecting out. Use a queue which is thread safe, and then somebody else solved the problem for you already. So and. The, the, the boss creates these workers typically, as many workers have CPUs. Actually, you can do more, I tried. And then I start the new threads, feeding it initial parameters, and then the main, main, most important thing, the thread doesn't have a return value, but rather puts it a result in a queue. So that's how it looks like. See, this is a, this um, worker again, and now I show you the relevant parts for the thread. So I get a queue, every thread gets a queue. Then we see the run method again. Yeah. And then the important thing here, uh, actually, uh, it, it reads the result. You see this, these are these column names. Yeah, we use pandas here to read the CSV, which is very, very convenient, actually. And then the important thing here. This is an important line. I put my result back in the queue. So I have an ID, so every thread gets a new ID, so I can tell them apart and just count up a num counter. Yeah. And I put my output, which is a, a pandas data frame. And that's it. So there's no return. I put it there, and then I'm done. I put it in the queue. That's how this communication works. And this is a main thread. And the main thread makes one queue. In this case, I use one queue. You can use different models. So it would make a different queue for each thread. That's also possible. I, I use one queue. And then I have a big loop here. And it's a bit involved here, but you don't need to understand everything. You see, I have IDs. I make as many as IDs as I need to make simulations. And I try to get the next ID. And after a while, all the IDs will be used up, and then I get a stop iteration exception, and then I break out of the loop and stop the whole thing. Yeah, set down to true, which will break later on when we see this. And now the important part is here. I make an instance of the worker, give it a queue. So that's the way the worker can put the result. And then I do a few checks down here. And here now it's unfortunately been moved out. You see, I say queue get, and queue get gives me the result. So the queue actually asks, is there something? And that's what I'm doing. So, so as soon as something in the queue, I get something out and get the next result. And since I attach the ID to each of them, and the worker gives me back the ID, I know which result it is. So I use this ID. And that's pretty much it. Yeah? And then here, at the end, I've joined the worker, so I kill the, the thread. Um, and here I also do I have two places actually where, where, where I get this get. Um, this is just for some, yeah, that's at the very end. So this is in the, the main loop, and then when I get fewer and fewer, I have, that's why I have a second get. So, but this is a communication. So the, the, the thread says put here, puts it in, and the main thread says uh, get and gets the result out. So no return value, but put and get. Very important. So Q, Q is actually the way to go here. OK. Now, what did I gain? So how did it work out? So compared to doing a serial calculation, you I just have one thread or one program without any threading, doing it one after the other. So I tested it on an Intel i5 uh, thing with eight cores. Actually, it's, uh, it's four CPUs, more or less, with hyper-threading. So and I, I keep eight CPUs uh, busy around 90% which is pretty good. So you won't get much faster than, get much more out of the 90%. And actually, amazingly, it scales up to 50 threads. So at first, I thought if I have eight cores or four CPUs, maybe four or eight would be a good one, but I tried more. And even I got a bit faster using more. So operating system somehow juggles those processes for me and it's doing this. And 95% or so of time, or even more, is spent in external processes. So my program actually is doing very little computation compared to external processes. And I just need to keep to feed them to get them run in parallel. And all the heavy lifting is done by the operating system because it's, it's doing the threads for me. So that's what you want. You want to have the minimal effort and get other people doing the hard work. In this case, it's uh, the operating system that's doing all the threads. Uh, I ran this on a Windows machine that executes Windows, but it also runs actually on on Mac because, or on Linux because I use Wine. So I didn't touch the executor, but I use Wine and it works because it's just a GUI program. So I can run it on my Mac also. Yeah. Okay. 
So that's what I did. There could be other ways of solving this, so that's just my approach. So you can use concurrent features, which is a part of Python. So I haven't used it, I don't know even why I didn't use it, but you can use it, it gives you a bit higher level approach there. So this gives you a, a, a thread pool and you don't have to handle it yourself. You could use multiprocessing, but I don't think that helps because since most of the time is spent in external process, Multiprocessing is starting even another external process which the Python interpret run. I don't it doesn't I don't gain anything here. But eventually you could move it to something on a cluster. So if you have a cluster and you would have because I have eighteen thousand independent processes, I could theoretically scale it on a cluster with eighteen thousand cores. Yeah, would run, would work something like this. And you could use something like Pyro4 or some other technology for this. So if you use Q, you're pretty close. You might have to change the, the, the flow a little bit, but you could use other technologies. But for our project, it was okay because it was supposed to only run on a single computer. And two and a half hours, the scientists are very happy with it. So typically, they're used to something running overnight. And everything that's less than overnight, that's, that's okay, fast enough. Good. Conclusions? Take home message. Use threads whenever you have input-output bound problems. Uh, the code, yes, you can see most of the code, it looks very much like serial. There's nothing special about threads, only those few places where I work with EQ. You know, and try to isolate them in, in, in separate methods whenever, methods whenever it's possible. And whenever it's possible, also use queues for communication, which makes your life much simpler than using shared data structures. Okay, thank you very much. And there's a few minutes for questions, I guess. So, who has questions? Uh, in the back, of course. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is about thread safety you mentioned. There might be some issues, like what uh, lines of your code could be changed so wrong things can happen? Like yeah, the main thing is if one of the sub doesn't finish, yeah, then this thread would, this, this one broker would block. That could be a problem here. Yeah, so uh, you need to you have some time out, which I don't have here now, to say oh, if this one doesn't come back after two or three minutes, then you need to either restart it or at least make a red flag that it didn't work. In my case, everything always finished. So all the calculation finished because it's a very simple statistical calculation. So there's no numerical problems that can happen. So I didn't have any too much error handling if the subprocess dies. In terms of threads, since they're totally, every worker is totally independent and doesn't interfere with the others, there shouldn't be a problem like a deadlock or anything because nobody's really waiting. The only one is waiting is the main thread for the worker to write a result. And if the worker never writes a result, it will wait forever. So in my case, it didn't happen, and we tried different versions. It works. If, if, if it would change, you would need to say, okay, uh, ID 5350 didn't finish. Now somebody has, many has to look what went wrong with this one. Or just, if you have 18,000, you, you lose two or three, that might be okay. Okay, any more questions? Okay. Um, my question is, uh, can you make it possible to have uh, multiple threads access the same data frame? So, for example, right there... Uh, you, you can, you can, uh, but it's difficult because you have to do locking. So if you want to have multi-processes access the same data structure, can be done, but they can... Uh, because threads are not deterministic. You don't know what, uh, at, at what time or when uh, this thread or the other thread is active. The opposite operating system is taking this over. So, typically, I would recommend try to avoid it. It's possible, but it increases the level of complexity possibly one order of magnitude. So make it as simple as possible. If you want to do this, uh, just like if you have an array and you have a shared array, just say, okay, you have four threads, subdivide your array in four, and this thread is working this part and this part, so they don't interfere with each other if, if possible. Yeah? Otherwise, you need to lock and say, now I'm doing something, and if you lock something, you have the potential for that lock. And it's very difficult to debug because it might never happen because it only happens once in 1,000 times. And it's really hard because you cannot reproduce this. And if you're going to reproduce this, you cannot debug it. So try to avoid shared data structures whenever possible. Um, if you really need something in parallel, 
and you do some computational heavy things, you might want to look at some other technologies anyway, like OpenMP or something with, with Sison or other parallel technologies, then Python threads might not be the way to go. That's my recommendation. Uh, my question is regarding the, the bottleneck. Is there a specific reason why you didn't use a, a database? So in order to avoid the bottleneck of writing to one file and having a database? Uh, actually, HDF5 is very close to a database. It's designed for scientific data, and there are a lot of benchmarks. Does HDF5 is, uh, for a lot of use cases, faster than Postgres for, for reading writing? Um, you can also, uh, the thing is, if you look at it, I spent 95% of the time in the external process. There's a little bit of reading writing, it's, it's just maybe a percent of the time. So even if I make it twice as fast, I go from 1% to half percent, it, does, it, it doesn't make any sense. You want to spend, uh, the, m most of the time is spent as an external process I cannot change anyway. So the performance only becomes because I don't wait to, f to finish one process or the other, I'm, I run 50 of them in parallel and that's where the time comes from. So the writing and reading to the file is not the bottleneck um, because the, the database also has to write it as a hard drive, eventually, or the SSD. So this would be the physical writing would be the limiting factor. But in, in this case, it doesn't really matter because this external process is dominating by far. Okay, any more questions? Yes, one more here. Ah, I didn't see you. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk, it was awesome. Uh, regarding reading the file, as it was so big, uh, you were reading it all at the same time, or you were reading a chunk, feeding it to a worker each time? Yeah, no, it, I have one, one big file with all the data, so HDF5 file, yeah? And I only have the, the, the main thread accessing the file. The workers never access any of this main file. They do generate intermediate files for the external program. So this XML file and this CSV files are generated by each worker. Yeah? And then, because the, the external program needs physical files. Yeah? So they generate these input files. They are pretty small. 9,000 lines is not a lot. Yeah? And then the external program reads them and writes an output, and then the worker reads the output. And changes into a data frame and hands the data frame back to the, to, the, uh, to the main thread. And the main thread eventually writes us in a big HDF5 file. I end up with a HDF5 file with 132 million lines. And then I need to rearrange them, which HDF5 is doing because you can index HDF5. And, I, and it's doing all the sorting for me. So I don't have to load everything in memory. I can index it. And it's sorting this and takes about half an hour to sort 132 million lines, which is pretty good. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Ah, I have to run today. Uh, what do you think about using uh, Greenlands instead of uh, threads for the same problem? Uh, can you repeat it? Uh, uh, what do you, do you think about uh, using Greenlets instead of threads? Greenlets? Yeah. I think it would be, uh, could also be done. There could be many approaches. You could use async programming if you want. Um, you can use greenlets, but if you use greenlets on async, you need to react or you need to, you need to totally change the, the way here. You can mainly use serial code as you would write a normal Python, and only this few things you have when you, when you work with those. You have to inherit from thread, and you have the run method, and you have the queue with a get input, and that's pretty much it. Yep, yep. Yeah, so it's a different thing. So it, typically, async, asynchronous programming can be much faster if you have hundreds of thousands of things going on at the same time, then threads is probably not the way to go. But here, I have eight CPUs, typically I don't have more than eight things going on at the same time, so threads are perfectly fine. So having a few thousand or 10,000 threads for nowadays computers shouldn't be a problem. If you want, you can run a million. I think I know probably you can easily run a million things at the same time. It's a bit different task. Yeah, so, but you could use greenlets, you can use, I think, you can use many different approaches. Uh, it just depends on your preferences what you know already and what's available here. I don't need an external library. And I think from, from my imagination, it's pretty easy to, to follow what's happening. If you have green lights, you have to learn how they work. But it's certainly possible. OK. Anyone else? No? OK. And then thanks, Mike. Give him an applause.